For those of you who are guests, thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us today. You know, I stand before you today emptied out. You know, I spent the week as well as my wife, you know, praying and interceding and fasting for you. You know, I believe God wants to do something in the midst of the men of Journey Church. And for many ways, when you get up here as a pastor, the messages that you're about to preach are oftentimes for the people who are not in this room more than the people who are in this room, right? You know, I believe and I think I need to remind us today that do you realize that you are created and formed in the image of God? You are called to be a person of dominion. You are called to walk in authority. Y'all are really quiet. I mean, like... You're created and formed in the image of God to walk in authority, to walk in power, to walk in anointing. You're called. Man, you're here. You're the ones. You know, there, there's 500 men in our church and you're the hundred who are here saying, man, God, I want more of you. That's an awesome thing. But we need to go also reach those others who aren't here with this message and pray and intercede for them. And I believe God has something big that he wants to do in your life. And when I talk about fasting, I'll get into it a little bit later on today. It's not just about the Daniel fast. I think some ways as Americans, we continue to dumb down stuff in our generation. I'm telling you, when I got saved, boy, I got saved in a, in a charismatic church. And that's how they talked to me when I walked in there. I was like, I don't know how to pray. Would you teach me how to put on the armor of God? Boy, you're going to learn how to pray right now. We're going to teach you what this is all about. When they talked about praying, when they talked about fasting, when they talked about interceding, it wasn't go fill yourself up with oatmeal and fruit every day. Come on, Jesus, you know. I'm cool with that to a degree, but I think God wants to take us to another level. Because guess what? The enemy is real. Do you believe that today? The enemy's real. Let's pray and we'll get into the word today. Father, we thank you and praise you. And I pray that today I be poured out that you might fill me with the words that you want to share with the people who are in this room today. That these words would not be mine, but they would be yours. They would be anointed with power. For my words carry no weight, but your words carry all weight and all authority and all power. I believe you've called us to a new thing, called us to the next level. And I believe that today will be a monumental day in the life of Journey Church where a stake is laid in the ground and you take us on a new adventure, a new journey where the men in this room will rise up unlike like they ever have before to an entirely new level of anointing, entirely new level of leadership, an entire new level of power and authority that they would walk it out in might and power in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody says, amen, amen, amen and amen. So I've opened up many messages with these words and I just feel led truly to do it again because I believe that it's real. I truly believe this with all of my heart and I hope that you do too because if you do not, the reality of these words is true nonetheless. We live in a world at war. We live in a world at war. The reality is that Satan committed cosmic rebellion and took a third of the angels with him. From the moment God created man in his own image in Genesis 1.26, Satan and his army have been set out to destroy us. That snake in the garden has increased in power year after year so that when you get to the book of Revelation, he is no longer a snake but a dragon. Do we get that? Do you understand the magnitude of your enemy? He is set out to destroy you and he is cunning, baffling, powerful beyond anything that we could ever compete with in our own spirit or in our own power. Given our own selves, you will be defeated. You will be defeated. We need to walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. John 10.10 gives us the devil's job description. It says the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Do you not see evidence of that all around you with the broken families and broken relationships and broken countries and broken racial relationships? Do you not see these things abounding in our generation even unto death? 
It stands in stark contrast to Jesus' job description listed in the very same verse. It says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have come that you might have life. Do you feel like you've got life right now? I hope you do. You're the ones who are here. I hope you do that your life is found in him. These casualties of war are all around us. I hinted at some. But think about how many marriages have been broken. How many people's finances, even in this room, are broke, busted, and disgusted? Think about the uh, number of people that we know in our circles that have been incarcerated. Think about the levels of fornication. Think about the levels of drug abuse. Think about the levels of abortion. Do you know an issue like abortion, which is no longer talked about anymore? That was worship unto Baal in the old days. They would sacrifice their babies unto Baal. Guess what? You could either serve Baal and go and die, or you could serve the God of the universe and live. Too often we serve the king of this world rather than serving the king of the universe, right? So why do we accept that in our generation that for the past 50 years we allow that to take place and we don't say anything anymore as Christians? Why are we all so quiet? We're, we're supposed to be men at war. We need to stand up for these kinds of issues again. They're not acceptable in our generation. So there's these deep, dark things like drug abuse, fornication, pornography, slavery, incarceration, broken finances, but there's often more subtle ones that are just as dangerous and kill us nonetheless. How often do we as men entertain ourselves to death? How often do we strive for power in our workplaces? How often do we see in our own generation a vacillation between being male chauvinists or being girly men in Jesus' name, right? Do we not see this? Do we not see the enemy out there trying to push these things over and over and over again? He declares that we as men are either male chauvinists and wants us to be some version of ourselves that we're not, that is not biblical in any way, shape, or form. Do you feel what I'm saying? Do you sense these things in the air? Do you sense the enemy's presence? See, I believe sadly that the devil has so emasculated men in America that we have forgotten how to fight. That's been what he's trying to do. He's trying to get us to forget how to fight. We seem so much more content following our favorite sports teams than fighting for our relationships and our wives, much less our God, right? We get fired up about those kinds of things, but we don't go fight for our God. We often pursue our career paths and hobbies over spending time with our kids. How many have spent more time on porn or video games than spending time with Christ, if we're willing to admit it? It's a truth, it's a pain, it's a challenge in, inside and outside of the church. Movies like Braveheart or 300 momentarily inspire us. But deep down we don't feel victorious, we feel defeated. We don't want to admit that we often feel like failures. We don't want to admit that we often feel inadequate. We feel like giving up, or many sadly already have. So I'm here today to reissue to you a battle cry for our own generation. I'm here to remind you that there is a race that God has called you to run and he's longing for you to suit up and get in the game. If you're created to be a leader, if you're created and formed in his image. You know, I got excited when I started hearing about all the different men's groups that we had going on. Those men have taken the challenge. They've stepped up to lead. They said, hey, I'm going to lead in this area. I'm going to make a difference in homelessness. I'm going to make a difference in the lives of veterans' wives. I'm going to make a difference by trying to raise up and disciple men. We need to come alongside guys like that. But more than that, you are the leaders. God's brought you here for a reason. You need to be the next generation leading a men's group. You need to be the next generation leading a small group. You need to be the next generation leading out. You're not called to sit passively by in the pews. You're not called to that. God's called you to lead. God's called you to lead. I'm here to remind you, in case we have forgotten, that there is a cause much bigger than yourself. There's a military campaign that God wants you to be a part of. To remind you, as I did at the beginning, that you're created and formed in the image of God. To remind you that Jesus said that you are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. To remind you that you are a masterpiece in God's eyes. 
That you were created and formed and planted here at this day and age on purpose for a reason. Some stand out and say, man, I wish I lived in biblical times. I'm here to tell you, you live in biblical times. Jesus is coming soon. And he wants you to stand up and stand out in our generation and live differently from the mess that we see out there today. I come challenging you to fight. That's why I wore this shirt today. It's time to fight the good fight, right? Not a fist fight between you and me. I might lose in here. It might just hurt. It might not be good. But a spiritual fight. A spiritual battle. I want to encourage you to fight for your relationship with God. Fight for the church. If you're married, fight for your wife and your marriage. Fight for your children. Fight for yourself to be set free from the sin that so easily entangles us and holds us back from being all that God has called us to be. And guess what? You're not alone in this fight. There's a band of brothers that's surrounding you that will fight alongside of you and that will cover your back and that's here with you in this room. You need only engage with them. There's men that will lovingly challenge you when you slip up. There's men that will hold your arms up when you're tired. There's men that will cry with you at some of the most challenging moments in your life and men that will celebrate with you with the good things that happen in your life. This is the message we need to carry to those who are not in this room. They're out there doing other things right now. They're not seeking or pursuing God. Maybe some obviously have legitimate reasons, but for many, they're sitting out there on the couch. They're playing Fortnite. They're blowing their lives on video games and things that are absolutely meaningless to what really matters when there's a war going on outside. If we saw the war in the natural, you wouldn't be playing video games, would you? Because we play these fake wars thinking that we're victorious in a world that is really at war. And we're ignoring the real war that sits outside of our doors and outside of our walls. So where does it start? How do we break the chains? How do we begin to move forward and walk in what God has called us to walk? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. As I stated, the challenges abound and there's only one way to bring down strongholds. It's to get on our knees and pray. This should be our posture, but somewhere along the way, we've lost this in our generation. We've fallen into that, hey, let's do the verse of the day kind of a mentality in Jesus' name, right? You think that's going to get us by? Why do you think we're getting so beat up as a people? Why do you think our nation looks the way that it is? Why do you think the nations look the way that they do? Because the men of God are afraid to get down on their knees and pray. The men of God are afraid to get down on their knees and cry out like men of old did that brought us into these very rooms. And we wonder why our churches are suffering. We wonder why our women are taking the lead all the time. Not that that's a bad thing per se, but God didn't call the women to lead the church. He called the men to lead in the church. There's an amazing story of the power of prayer at work in Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, About this time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who were belonging to the church. He killed James and the brother of John with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So he's got a death sentence on him. You see, John had already been killed. Others had already been killed for their faith. There's no doubt the intent is to see Peter dead. There's no doubt, right? It's going to happen. You've got legions of guards surrounding them. You've got Jews with no weapons that are there. Do you think they even stand a chance? Should they even have wanted to get up and fight against the Roman army at that particular state in a natural sense? There's no way they would have been victorious. Yet something was going on behind the scenes. So Peter's days are numbered. Yet a remnant was doing something. 
Were they hatching some grand escape plan like we watch in the movies? Like, hey, let's go do this and we'll take it over and we'll blow up this door and sneak in and we'll snag them and we'll do all these kinds of things. No, they weren't seeking some plan that might work out in the natural They were doing something supernatural. They began to pray and intercede for God to break through. And man, would he do that. Amen, amen, amen. He would. God would do something powerful. It says in Acts chapter 12 verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him to God by the church. Earnest prayer was lifted up. The believers were interceding for Peter, praying and bringing down strongholds. So those of you who attend Journey Church know we're in a season of prayer and fasting. And man, I don't want this to be some girly season of prayer and fasting. You know, I I honestly debated whether we even had food at this this morning. Because I think when I talked about earlier, you know, we dumb down as Americans for some, some reason a lot of the things that we see. And it's become very popular to do 21 day fast surrounding the Daniel fast. But I would question in our minds, let's just think about this for a second as men, if you really start to get to the heart of it. Is a Daniel fast really a fast? Maybe, right? It certainly was. It was effective. God used it in his day to do what it needed to do at that particular season. Again, I always like to offer disclaimers. Nobody feel guilty if you're sick, if you've got anything like that going on that would be something that you can't do it. But guys, we got to step up and go to the next level. When's the last time you skipped a meal so that you could pray and intercede for God? Not go back there and eat something. I'm talking genuinely skip some meals so that you could feel the pain of hunger in your hearts and longing in your souls for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, there's things in the Bible when it talks about these strongholds that says these kind don't come out except by prayer and fasting. You think if you're getting all filled up, even if it's supposedly vegetable, some of you are already vegetarian, so that don't count anyways in Jesus' name, right? Do you think you're really going to see the breakthrough that you want? Why are you all being so quiet in here? Can I tell you this week... uh, I don't say this, I'm not bragging, I'm not doing anything. In fact, I felt like a failure, to be honest with you, in some of it, because I set out that I was going to try to do as many days as I could with just water and going in and praying and fasting and not eating anything and saying, Lord, help me. And then, man, as the devil would do the very first day of the fast, I was sick as a dog. I mean, I was sick, sick, sick. So I said, I'm going to eat at night. So I went for 48 hours without eating anything, without drinking anything but water. And then I had to give in and got me some chicken soup by Campbell's. Come on, Jesus. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, I had to at night because I was just sick, you know. But I'm telling you, there's others that are kicking our butt even in this area. You know, my wife is not drinking one thing but water the whole time. I'm not saying that to get praise for her. She understands the nature of the battle that we're in. She understands the nature. I'm like, how long are you going to go, honey? I feel like a failure. I got to go eat some chicken soup at night. Come on. What, I mean, what is wrong with me? My wife is kicking my butt even in this, right? Because she understands the nature of the battle. So when I'm challenging you to fast, I'm not here to tell you if you do the Daniel fast the whole time, that's wrong. No, you will get some benefit from that. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to take it to the next level. Man, if you've never fasted before, fast breakfast and then do lunch and dinner. The next day, fast breakfast and lunch. The next day, fast breakfast, lunch and dinner. Whatever you got to do. If you don't feel those pains of hunger in your heart and in your mind, you are never going to experience all that God has for you. I'm here to tell you that right now. If you never do that, you're never going to experience the kind of breakthroughs that are needed because strongholds abound. Your stronghold might be running through your heart and mind right this very moment. Like, man, I wish I could get over this. These kind don't come out except by prayer and fasting. If we want to see a breakthrough in our church, if we want to see a breakthrough in our city or our nation or our world, we're going to have to be a people defined by getting down on our knees. See, when this season ends, when these 21 days end, I'm going to actually extend the prayer series beyond that because I think, you, one, you can't cover prayer in three weeks. It just doesn't happen. I mean, is is one thing. But I don't want people to get the impression that we end in 21 days and then it's over. That's just the beginning. 
That's the plowing of the ground. That's the seed planting. That's the getting ready. You know, that's the getting ready for future harvest time, right? But man, this has to become part of our life and who we are. That we are defined as a people of prayer. We're defined as a people who are passionate for our God. We're defined as a people who are ready to step up and lead in this day and age, in this generation. It's a time where we need to get some of the stuff that we shouldn't be doing out of our lives because the time is running short, I'm here to tell you. Things are heating up every day on the national and world scenes. Things are getting worse and not better, I'm here to tell you, right? Do you sense it? They have those jobs reports saying everything's so beautiful. Do you all feel that in the natural? I mean, like... No, there's pain that's out there that abounds and we need to step up and make a difference. Can I get an amen? Is anybody excited about that? Is anybody ready for that? So let this season be a time of activating our faith to develop a greater intimacy with Christ. May it also be a time of breakthrough. May it be a time of seeing marriages be restored. A time of people being freed from the things that have challenged them for years. A time where people are going to even be healed physically. Men, my battle cry for you is to lead the way in prayer. For you to lead your households and grab that prayer sheet that we have there and get out in front of your wife and don't wait for her to initiate. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but for those of you who are married, when's the last time you prayed with your wife? When's the last time you said, honey... Can I grab your hands and pray? Now, I know prayer can get weird sometimes, right? Y'all be in those prayer circles and you're wondering, what did that guy just touch before he touched my hand or what did that person touch before he touched my hand? And then some of those guys have that old King James prayer, come on, right? You know what I'm talking about? Thus saith the Lord and praise you Jesus and these and thous and all that and they sound like professional prayer people. That's not what God's after. He's after people with a genuine heart who say, man, Lord, I need you. I need your help. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. All I know is things aren't right. And Lord, I need wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment. Would you help me? Oh God, would we begin to cry out? Would we lead? How many of you does your wife have to beg you to come to church? Man, you want to get some tomorrow night? You go, it's not, honey, will you set everything out? Will you go and you like it? Honey, will you get everything set up? And uh, I'll get the kids ready and I'll have it and, you know, I'll be all set up. You know, I'll be, you know, just ready for it, you know? Would you lead in your household and let your wives know that you are a man of God and don't do it in some weird chauvinistic way? No, honey, I want to pray with you. Even if I sound stupid, I want to pray with you because I love God and I love you. And I want our marriage to be preserved or I want my marriage to be restored and I want my marriage to be all that it can be in Jesus' name. I won't read you the part about you're supposed to abstain during seasons of prayer and fasting, though. Come on. uh, You could violate that one. I give you all permission. We didn't call for that part in this particular fast. What was the result of their prayers? Acts 12, 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And centuries before the door were guarding the prison, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to them, and a light shone around the cell. And he struck Peter on the side, and he woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And so he did, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not not know what was being done by the angel. He did not know if what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed by the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and along the street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people. And what they were expecting, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where they were gathered together and praying. And we knocked on the door of the gateway. A servant girl named Rhoda came to hear the answer. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Man, I think about that, and oftentimes, even when we do begin to step up in prayer, we don't believe that the Lord's going to answer our prayers. 
I was blessed. There was a guy, I've shared this story if you've been around Journey a long time. There was a guy named Tim. And Tim was the most unlikely of characters. He was a very large man. And he would pull up to the church in the old days with a truck. And the back of the bed of the truck would have beer cans thrown in the back of the can. And he would still smoke. And people would walk up to me and be like, why do you let Tim park right in front of the thing? He's out there smoking. We could clearly see the beer cans in the back of the truck. And I'm like, have you ever had a conversation with Tim? And they're like, no. Well, before you come talk to me, you go have a conversation with Tim. Um, if you hear Tim's backstory and his testimony, he was a heroin dealer and heroin addict for a long time in his life. He was all into all kinds of crazy things. He had gotten himself to where he was weighing close to 500 pounds, and there came a day in his life where he said, Lord, if you don't do something, I'm going to blow my brains out. And he literally had everything all set up. He sent his wife off. He had the gun. He had everything. And then God interceded in a very miraculous way in his life, completely delivered him from that lifestyle, completely delivered him from that weight issue and made him go from all those pounds down to where he was at the time that people met him. For him, the least of his problems was a couple beers and cigarettes from if you hear his whole story. Can, can I get an amen, right? I'm not saying that beer or cigarettes is good. Over time, God transforms us from glory to glory. He begins to continue to take those things from our life. But if you judge someone by that outward appearance, you don't know how far they've actually already come, right? So there was significant progress. I say that to say this. He was a man of great prayer. He was a good old country boy. He was like, Eric, you want to see the real Clay County? I'm like, what? He, uh, that wasn't the best country accent, but he goes, he goes, you ever seen that movie, Children of the Corn? I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? Now I live in Clay Hill, so go figure. You know, it's like, a, but uh, he's like, that's the, there's a real spiritual battle that's going on. And he had this way of saying, God would answer prayers. We would pray that we would have chairs. And then all of a sudden, God would have chairs. And we'd be like, wow, I can't believe God had chairs. And he goes, boy, you mean God answers prayer? He would always say the same thing to me every time. I would get so mad. Boy, you mean God answers prayer? I'm here to tell you that he does. God answered those prayers for Tim. God's answered many prayers on your behalf already. But there's so much more that he wants to do in us and through us, not just during these remaining 14 days of this fast, but I believe this is a pivotal transformational moment that God wants to do something really special and in through the Men of Journey Church. Band, I would ask you to come back up. We're still going to get out of here early, I promise you. You're going to have the whole day to yourselves. But I want to spend just a few more moments in worship and prayer. Here's the first prayer topic that I want to have on the back of your mind as we begin this particular session. Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers that are made in this place. Men, if this needs to be a moment of repentance, I'm not talking corporately here about how this particular verse is often used, praying for our nation, praying for our government, praying for our corporate land. I'm talking about your land. I'm talking about your life, your family, your job, your children, your own lives, the things that you're dealing with and the things that you're going through. God wants to bring healing to your land. Who is he addressing this particular message to? It wasn't to the people who were out there that were just normal people. He was addressing this message to the church. He's saying that if there be sin in your lives then guess what? It starts to need to go by the wayside. So during this song, maybe allow God to stir some stuff in your heart and your mind that you need to repent for. And I'm not asking you to come up here and publicly confess it, but this could be your miracle breakthrough moment. People have been fasting for you. People have been praying for you. Maybe you've also been praying and fasting. God answers prayer. Don't 
walk out of here the same way that you walked in. Begin to do intercession. We'll be teaching that on the weekends in the days ahead. If you don't know what it means to intercede, if you don't know what it means to go deep in your prayer life and ask God and beg him to do things on your behalf, I'm here to teach you that in the days ahead. But start to cry out for your land and say, Lord, would you restore my marriage? Lord, would you restore my children? Lord, would you save so-and-so from the addictions that they're in? Lord, would you free me from these particular bondages? I want to fully serve you. I want to live for you all the days of my life, but these things are holding me back. Lord, would you free me from those things so that I could freely live for you? Would you rise with me and worship and pray? Lord, we praise you and give you glory. Father, during this song, let it be a moment of intercession, a moment where heaven meets the people in this room. As that verse described, would you hear and be attentive to the prayers that are lifted in this place during these moments that we have together? Would this truly be a breakthrough moment for the men of Journey Church in Jesus' name? Amen.